Alright, so, um, this video is going to be on why sylvans are not good, basically. Um, I've been speaking with a lot of people about the stuff that is going to come out in Primal Origins. I've done a lot of testing, I've observed OCG results, um, because I'm not really going to be going to any big tournaments until Euros, so I've been sort of just looking ahead the stuff that will be good then um and people within like my locals and just online uh have the opinion that bujins will be really good and that sylvans will be the best or something that's the general consensus um and i'm seeing that opinion mirrored a lot um i agree that bujins will be a very good deck because hirame is is a good piece of support it's a piece of support that is useful for them to have um it doesn't push the deck into like op territory or anything it's still it's still basically the same but it just has a couple new toys to play with um my dolce's get angeli which is a, a very good toy for them instant hoot cake um but sylvan's i'm, I'm gonna say this right now Sylvans are not anywhere near as good as everyone is making them out to be. They will not be the best deck. They will they will not be anywhere near the best deck. Um, unless they get some seriously powerful uh, TCG exclusives brought in to push them over. But it's, it's unlikely. And just based off what there is now, I would say that they aren't going to be the best deck. And I have some reasons as to why I believe this. The first one is that decks that rely on one card plays are just going to be better than decks that rely on combo plays, multiple card plays. Um, I would define a combo deck as a deck that necessitates um, having multiple cards in order to do anything do anything because the cards aren't good on their own and we've seen this seen this recently with plus one fire fist and gear gear <sighs> seen this since i've been playing the rescue cat with dino rabbit um so yeah just just a couple of examples of decks that really feature um, one card plays and have that sort of very grindy potential aspect about them where they have a low monster count, a, a similar sort of uh, spell count and a similar sort of trap count where it's like 3-3-3 three, 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 generally. Um, and the reason why um, such a thing is the case is just on a very simple mathematical level. If I need two cards to go off then I'm going to see those two less than I will see a, a situation where I need one card to go off this it's like conditional probability so um, say there's a one in two chance of me drawing into one card and then obviously one in two chance of me not drawing it and then I'd also need a one in two chance of drawing the other one and a 1 in 2 chance of not drawing it. The chance of me drawing both is half times half, which is a quarter. Um, well, if I just need the one card, then it's half. And the probability for that is not is not accurate. I'm not using actual statistics that would apply. But the point is to, uh, is to show that the more factors you add in, the less probable it will be that you will get the things that you want. So it's less likely that I will draw Hieratic Dragon of Su and Hieratic Dragon of Tefnuit than it is that I will draw Fire Formation Tanky or Brotherhood of the Fire Fist Bear. And it's, it's a skewed example, like, don't be some weird Hieratic fanboy implied, like, yeah, but you can have, you can have Esset and Nepte in Convocation. Like, the point, again, is just to demonstrate that decks that necessitate, um, two cards are worse than decks that necessitate one and if you look at sylvans they don't have one card plays um the deck 
is a combo deck because if if you summon a sylvan and you excavate a sylvan then both become productive but if you summon a sylvan and you don't excavate a sylvan then the sylvan that you just summoned was unproductive so the card is is not good on its own because it relies on an on something else even though it's not in your hand it relies on something on top of your deck in order to uh, be good so it makes it a combo deck um, and then people might the common counter argument I'm given is like oh what about uh, wind-ups and Mamel um, and I got I got plant synchro the other day as, as a counter argument as well so plant synchro briefly is not a combo deck. It's a deck filled with floaters that had the propen that had the capacity, sorry, to combo. Um, because of how things interact with each other. But you look at things like Reborn Tengu and Tour Guide, they aren't necessarily combo cards. They're just cards that are good, they're just floaters that are good on their own. And then the deck could combo. Wind ups were quite similar. Um, either you can look at it as a combo or a non combo deck. If you look at it as a non combo deck, that one makes sense because you have things like Rabbit, you have things like Factory which are good on their own um, if you run towards the end start to run card card e and or bear and a lot of back row that was just decent removal so all those things are good on their own um, but only to a certain degree so you could argue there was a combo deck because factory isn't good on its own the only card that is on a base level good on its own is wind up rabbit and tour guide I th I, yeah I think people ran that I don't know it was a long time ago um, but um, it's, it may be perceived as a combo deck, but it didn't need to combo in order to win. Like, you didn't need the two pieces in order to go and win. It wasn't it wasn't like that. You could win by grinding out games with Rabbit and just getting factory searches and stuff like that. You could win games like that. So it, it didn't necessitate having multiple pieces in order to win the game. Also, factory gave the deck a toolbox engine which most combo decks don't have and therefore allowed windups to become better um, because it increased just again on a mathematical level you no longer had to rely on drawing shark and magician you could search one of the two which meant you only had to draw one and you didn't even have to draw that one because you could just search twice if you were so lucky um, so makes a lot of sense as to why windups were a good deck even if you do define them as a combo deck because things like factory solve the math it's solve the math problem um, and the fact that the deck could function on its own as well it could do those one card plays made it even better so it's not comparable and Murmel has a similar story in that it has its own advantage engine in Lind and Sphere and everything floats so um, for the first point, it's the same as Windup, replace Factory with Sphere and Lind, the fact that you have that and you can toolbox things, just with the general mechanics of like Pike and Teus, the fact that you can toolbox things means that rather than having to draw into X and Y, you can search them, thereby uh, mitigating the extent that you would have to draw into them, uh, reducing your probability of doing well um doing well i mean like drawing the stuff that you need in order to win the game also the fact that everything floats and you gain pluses quite consistently means that you can function better in a grind game scenario because the fact that you're plussing off things uh that's the simple things like uh taste gund if you have a thing in grave an atlantean or whatever the fact that you're plussing um, as well as setting up the hand that you want means that you're in a better position to win the grind game um, which uh, which other decks don't have so say say like say hieratics or something if I go um, special Sue tribute Sue summon Tefnuit sorry all the way around special Tefnuit tribute Tefnuit, uh, Tefnuit summon Sue get a search and ATT then I go minus one but if I'm if I'm playing Mermel and I like discarded 
an abyss lead for Teus. And ATT, then I even. If I discard Gund for Teus, and then search, and then summon something, and ATT, then I still evened. Even though they killed the same number of cards as they did with the Tefnuit. Uh, with the Hieratic example. Because the fact that you generate pluses means that you're in a better capacity to survive the grind game. Do you need to? Um, so, the examples of Murmel and Windups are quite skewed. Um, because Sylvans don't have the same toolboxy effect that Murmels and uh, Windups did. Uh, Murmels do, because at this time uh, of speaking, they haven't been hit by the Banners yet. Um, but. Yeah, Sylvans don't have that, so I would say that they wanted to make a, some broken support for Sylvans then. Just give them give them that toolbox card. Um, but I, I don't know enough about their weaknesses to know the right card to print. But as it stands, the fact that they are a deck that needs you to have multiple things... Um, Need you to have X card on top of your deck and X card to reveal the card on top of your deck in order to go off is a weakness. When compared with something like Artifacts, where you have Theo into blue, which is the most basic one card play, that is great because it gives you that plus one. Like, you know, you, you, will, uh, you will do better in terms of consistency with... Uh, Artifacts, just on a very base advantage level. Um, then, on the topic of needing the things to be on top of your deck, there's a criticism of excavating, in that excavating is not a broken mechanic. If you look at um, something like Mamel and Windups, they, they don't rely on any particular mechanic, and the things that they do are um, basically searching between Factory and uh, Mamel's, and then Special Summoning. Um, searching is something that you want to do, because you're adding cards from your deck to your hand, it's giving you more options. But with um, Sylvan's, their mechanic is revealing the top card of your deck. Now, that's, that's not one of the things that you would want to do, objectively speaking. You'd want to draw cards, or search cards, or uh, just special summon for for free, realistically speaking. You'd want free summons, um, and Sylvans, Sylvans don't really offer that. They offer a little bit of board control, depending on if you reveal the right thing. Uh, charity gives you draw, but the, the monsters themselves, um, on a base level, the cards themselves, don't offer you those things. The, the mechanic is revealing the top card of your deck, and there's never a time you're going to be like, Yay, I'm so happy to reveal the top card of my deck. Like, whoa, so good. It's it's never going to be good. Even just like summon, if you summon uh, uh, Magician of Prophecy and search secrets, like, you're, you're, you're quite happy to be searching secrets, or whatever you're going to be searching. You're quite happy to be searching, even though everything is just breaking even. Um... Even if, arguably, it's, it's arbitrary. I mean, fate is what makes the advantage tangible. But you're never going to be like, Damn, I'm excavating. That's so good. Because with excavating, the top card of your deck has to be what you want in order to be rewarded for excavating. Which means, conversely, that if the top card of your deck is not what you want, then you are punished for excavating. So if I summon Marshall Leaf and I reveal the top card of my deck, and it's a Sylvan, and I send it to the grave, and it's like the one that pops something, but like it's the one that pops a monster, or one that pops a spell or trap, and I do it, then I've been rewarded in a tangible advantage sense. I've been I've been rewarded numerically for revealing the top card of my deck and it being the one that I want to do. But if I revealed a spell or trap or a different card that wasn't a Sylvan, then I I wouldn't be rewarded. The card would go to the bottom of the deck, and the summoning of the Marsh Leaf would have been obsolete. It would have been arbitrary. It wouldn't have served any function. And then nothing good would have come of it. It would have been a useless card, which is not good. Like that's that's not something that you want to do. It places places um uh, your your game plan on external factors that you can't control. It places it on things 
so, like revealing the top card of your deck. That dictates uh, that dictates whether you win the game. That dictates whether you're able to make plays. That's not good. It's better not to rely on such things. If I draw my hand, I want to be able to do what I can do based on what is in my hand, not based on what is not in my hand, based on what is on the top of my deck or something like that. It's comparable with um with Light Swans and Millet. Because Light Swans have good enough support. I mean, they have, they have Judgment Dragon. They have the most powerful boss monster. Like, one of the most powerful boss monsters ever printed. Probably the most powerful boss monster ever printed. But still, they rely on that luck factor, which means that they can't consistently do well. Because if they summon it, if they summon a Light Swan and they mill something bad, then that will hinder them. But if they summon a more good, then they'll probably win. That's just how it is. But the fact that they aren't topping, that they aren't doing anything, is a testament to the fact that relying on things that are outside of your control, adding more external factors that you can't control, considering that you already rely on drawing a good hand and going first, which are two huge things, and um, having the opponent draw worse than you, that's another big thing. Those are three really big things that you can never control, unless you're an amazing cheater. Like, those three things you can never control, that will ultimately stop you from winning. Um, you're going to add another thing into that of, well, I also have to make sure that the top card of my deck is the right card. For a mechanic that doesn't do anything, <laughs> like revealing the top card does not do anything unless you reveal the right card. And then, what? That's that's meant to be better than decks that just do things on their own. It's, it's it, it doesn't make any sense. I don't know why you would put yourself in that position by running... Um, a deck that relies on a mechanic that isn't good and, and is inherently going to be luck based. But the difference between Sylvans and Light Swans is that Light Swans can mill mediocre, but it's fine because their their game plan is to just mill as much as possible to set up the Judgment Dragon. Because JD is broken enough, just on its own, that if you summon it and you protect it, then you're, you're gonna be fine. You're probably gonna win anyway without having to mill the absolute nuts. While Sylvans don't have that. Sylvans don't have their JD. They have to rely on excavating the Sylvan every time. Uh, which isn't good. Which leads me on to my next point. Because what that means is that you're going to be running more of the support. Because the support is great. The support is what allows them to be good by stacking um, the things to top of the deck. Uh, Charity in particular is obviously really good. Um... And you're going to be running a surplus on monsters as well to make sure that the thing that you do reveal is good. Um, but what that means is that you're running a surplus of support cards, and it's like cards within the within the archetype. But let's let's say I run three of the mushroom, three martial leaf, uh, three peacekeeper, three of the eighteen hundred. I don't know if that's best, but um, just speculative. And let's say I draw. Any two of um, those 12 cards that I'd be running. So I draw any two of them in my opening hand. One of them would not be useful immediately. Because the two of them are doing the same thing. The two of them serve the same function. So, in this case, for this deck, drawing multiples of monsters is not all that good. Which is why a card like Sylvan Charity is so good. Because it allows you to return the bad stuff, put it on top of your deck to use for the other stuff. Like, Charity is really good. They, they address this problem quite well. But it's not enough because you'll open clumpy monster hands that you won't be able to do anything with. And even if you have something like Lone Fire Blossom, then that adds to it because of the normal summon dependency. And the dependency of the thing that is on top of your deck being correct. You have to run a surplus of monsters and a surplus of support. The support being important because you have to make sure that the thing on top of your deck is correct. And if you run one Sylvania, then you run the risk of them killing it. And then you no longer being able to stack it to the top of your deck. So then you run multiples. And drawing multiples of a field spell is never good. Um, it's this a weird paradoxical thing. Because you never want to run multiples of a field spell in theory. Um, but you have to because obviously you can get MST'd or whatever. Um... So that's, that's poor. Charity is great. And then you run like M Miracle Fertilizer and Super Solid Nutrients. Some people choose to. Further increasing the extent that the deck has to run 
um, combo support because the cards aren't good on their own. It's, it makes it makes no sense. Um, it's it's better. It's better when you have decks that don't have to run a surplus of monsters. Um, themed monsters, I should say. Monsters that don't do anything on their own. Um, and then people will say, like, well, look at Murmel. The difference between Murmel and Sylvans is that Murmels want to have a bunch of monsters in their hand. Because it allows them to use the effects of the other monsters to search things and set up their plays. Um, a handful of waters is fine. Firstly, because that's how you... Um, how you use them to search and also because you get to sculpt your hand you can't really do that with Sylvans the support allows you to sculpt your hand to some extent but not to a large enough extent because odds are you're going to be drawing into more support and it, it, it won't be good enough um, compare it with something like artifacts where for for my engine what I'm currently running is um three blue two red two movement three theosophy that's 10 cards all of which are arguably the, the artifacts aren't good on their own but the mst is good on its own as long as i have an artifact left in the deck theosophy it's good on its own as long as i have an artifact left in the deck which i probably will considering i run five um so which means I have a lot more space to just run back row and run run things that are good on their own. Run things like Card Cardi and Trap Tricks, Mamelio, and I run, I run Majesty's Fiend. Have you summoned a Majesty's Fiend before? That card is insane. Like, you summon it, and then they either kill it or they lose most of the time. But if someone summons it against me, that's fine. I have enough back row to potentially kill it. If, if I summon it against them, they have no back row because they're running all the Sylvans and all the Sylvan support. But that doesn't have to be Majesty's Fiend, that's a skewed example, that could be anything. They don't have the defensive spine in order to deal with these threats because they have to run a surplus of theme support. And the theme support is not good on its own because it's a combo deck, which increases the probability of them being okay, because the chances of you excavating the top card of your deck and it being a Sylvan is increased, but also makes you worse off because you're further relying on the combo factor. You're further relying on excavating and hoping that the top card of your deck is fine. You're further relying on doing combos instead of just running a simple sort of deck with back row. Um, something like Bujins where you, you just dig for that one card in Yamato, you desperately try and get it, and then just grind it out because it is a strong card. Or Artifacts where you flip Theosophy into the blue and you pop something, and then you sit behind back row and until they kill it, and then when they kill it, you're still probably winning the Attrition War because they have to expend two cards to deal with your one if you think about the fact that Theosophy into blue will pop something and then it will attack for 2-1 and either they'll lose or they'll kill it and then you can do other things um yeah the fact that you have to run a surplus of theme support is not good for Sylvans uh so I think I think that's enough in in summary the three reasons why I would speculate that Sylvans are not the best deck um or will be a good deck by any means of comparison I think artifacts will be the best personally. Um, actually, I'll I'll discuss artifacts. The reason why I think artifacts will be good is just because Theo into blue is so strong. That's it. The rest of the support isn't very good. The, the rest of the cards, sorry, the rest of the cards aren't very good. Um, Kadu is okay, um, but uh, it relies on other things, so you probably wouldn't want that. Red is a necessary evil in case you draw into blue, and it allows you to do your rank five stuff. So that's pretty cool. Um, green is okay, but it's not amazing, and then like Achilles is like the the shield ones are okay, but they aren't great. The one that special songs from the hand is isn't really great. So, um, really, just it's it's Theo into blue. Like Theo into blue is the deck, but that is stupidly strong in itself. And the fact that uh, artifacts are topping an OCG where you have a very dragon heavy format is a testament to how strong that is. Firstly, as a disruptive play. But also then as an aggressive momentum play, it's, it's ridiculous. Um, so yeah, I, I think it'll be the best deck. I think it'll be the best deck just for all the reasons I've said as to why Sylvans aren't the best deck. So Sylvans won't be the best because they rely on multiple card combos. 
um, instead of just they have nothing that is good on its own, which is also why artifacts are great because the deck just is uh, built upon uh, one one card plays, uh, a one card play I should say, which is Theo into a uh, more attack, but then you can run a bunch of other floaters because that engine is concise enough on its own. You can run other floaters like Card and Trap Tricks and Melio and um, random other stuff. Like I run two Majesty Fiend because it's, it's it's a stupidly strong card. Um, I run Thunder King because it's a good monster on its own. Things like that. You can run that sort of floater game um, because everything is good on its own. I will draw most hands and be happy with most hands because everything will serve a function on its own. Which Sylvans don't have. And it's a bad mechanic. Artifacts don't rely on a bad mechanic. In theory they do. Because in theory having to be destroyed by a card effect is very reactive. Which is obviously easy to stop if you're the opponent. You just don't kill their back row. Um, or you kill it during uh, your opponent's end phase. So that they won't trigger. So that's fine. But they have Theosophy. Which is an incredibly proactive card. Um, which strips all of that away. So the mechanic doesn't come into it. The destroying back row thing doesn't come into it. You don't wait for your opponent to MSD you or anything. It's never like that. Um, you use the trap. And you use Call of the Haunteds and things like that. Just get those simple pluses and attack. So it doesn't rely on a bad mechanic. Sylvans do. Because uh, no one wants to excavate. Really, objectively speaking. And you're placing um, more reliance on luck. Which you can't control. Um which isn't good and they have to run a surplus of monsters that don't do anything and support that only works within the theme uh, which means you have clumpy hands and you have less space to run things that you might want to such as a defensive spine the back row things like that artifacts don't have that problem because you can flip theosophy into blue that is your deck that is your game plan, and if you're if you're watching this and you're like, oh no, I run I run like twenty artifacts and I run malevolent catastrophe and all that stuff, like no, honestly, and a heavy artifact build is just as bad as like any deck. It's is worse than my criticism of Sylvans. Like, don't focus on the reactive aspect of it. Just focus on Theo into blue. That is your deck. Um. But, yeah, in doing so, I have a concise engine. My engine is 10 cards. You can run a 6 card engine. You could run 3 Theo, 3, um, three Blue. But I choose to run um, Red to make the Blue more consistent. And Movement, because Movement's pretty cool. Uh, but that, that might change. You could run... I would, I would, I would be happy running 3 Blue, 1 Red, 3 Theo. No Movement. Because you can run MST. Like, that, that would be fine as well. So, the fact that you can condense the engine to such a small size and it would still retain its utility, it would still be just as good. Really, the only thing that you're messing around with is trying to uh, strike the balance between um, being able to still make plays when you draw a handful of artifact stuff, which is what red is for, and um, uh, not running dead cards, which is why you would drop them. Well, once you find the balance between that, you're golden, but you already know that the engine is concise as hell, which means you can run a bunch of other things, you can run a bunch of other support, which means that when they do something, like when Sylvans do go off and they drop a Felground and a I, I'll, I'll have back row to deal with it, because that's how my deck works, that's how the deck works. Well, if I <laughs> summon, <laughs> summon blue and attack, or I make a Plades and I attack, they won't, they won't have a back row, they, they won't have back row to deal with it, probably. They'll have very little. They'll, they'll have probably half a dozen, maybe, in terms of space. Um, given how much they have to bulk out the engine as a logical necessity. So, this is why, in my opinion, Sylvans will not be the best deck. They'll be nowhere near the best deck. They'll be an okay deck. As far as things that come out on Primal Origin, um, I think that the best deck in the set are Artifacts. Just because Theosophy into Blue is so strong. I think that Bujins get good support. And they will definitely be a contender for that sort of time. 
probably after everything else gets hit, because they will, I guess. Um, my Dolce's get Anjali, which is a very good piece of support. I think that's the best piece of individual support that a deck gets, because that, that does a lot for my Dolce's. It's really good. And um, the best card in the set, I would say, I haven't looked at the entire set, but I'd say the best card is Majesty's Fiend. Like, that card is stupidly strong. I run to, um, but, like, I see, I, I've seen a lot of people trying to build, like, Sinistry Yoroshiro decks around it. Like, you don't need to, just, like, in Artifacts, like, I can go into blue, I can Tribute Summon it, I can attack. And then they need the out, or they lose. If you're playing Sylvans, or anything, you can just Tribute Summon it. And it's fine because it's the strongest card. Like it's it's ridiculous. Imagine if you had that summon against you. It's this strong. So I think that um, Theo into blue will definitely dictate the format. Uh, the format after Primal Origins gets released. I think the Majesty's Fiend will be either the card that everyone hypes up, or the card that no one hypes up and then destroys the game. Destroys the game being being relative. Like it's it's a very powerful card. It's 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 not difficult to deal with. There are ways to deal with it, but. It's, it's incredibly strong. So, yeah. <sighs> yeah, thank you for watching. If you watched it for this long, um, just felt like I should make that video to address some points. And, um, yeah, cool. See you around.